I just want to tell the larger community who will be seeing this at some point um, how um, this wonderful opportunity came to be. Um, my seventh graders, these students here, read a book called Refugee by Alan Gratz. It has three stories of different refugees that take place in three different time periods. One of those time periods is 1939 Germany. Um, when some Jewish people boarded the MS St. Louis um, and sailed to Cuba thinking that they would um, be able to get off the ship there and have sanctuary there. Um, that, in fact, didn't happen. Um, right before Christmas, the universe gave me a gift of, um, I don't have it right there, but a seven days article. And um, I read it, and I just couldn't believe it. It was about um, a woman, Miss Jane Keibel, who sailed on the MS St. Louis. And um, my students, all of you, read it. And we had did some teamwork and discussion on it. And it was decided that we really wanted to meet Miss Keibel. So you all wrote her letters, and we sent her a copy of the book. And um, her son, Peter Keibel, who's with us here also, um, and his wife, Carol, um, emailed me. And here we are today. So I'm really excited for this opportunity. And I think you are too. And I think that Ms. Keibel will introduce herself while she tells her story. So I'm going to um, turn this over to her. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak. I was very surprised to receive the book Refugee that you sent and all the letters asking me to come. I was amazed that you wanted to hear my story. Can you imagine to be forced to leave a country where you were born, where your parents, grandparents, uncle, aunts, and cousins live a productive and comfortable life? Our ancestors were traced back to three centuries. Well, this is what happened to me. I was born in Germany. I attended school there until there was a change in government. In 1933, Adolf Hitler was elected chancellor, which is similar to a president in our country. My parents, my younger sister, and I lived in a medium-sized city in the Rhine War area. My father owned a department store in that town. My sister and I attended public schools. My father was well known because of the store, and we were comfortable circumstances. Hitler had a very definite idea of what he wanted the country to be. He disliked Jews, <coughs> who in his, <coughs> pardon me, who in this opinion did not look at and seem like Germans. Of course, that was not true, because like my father, many other Jews fought for Germany in World War I. In 1933, when Hitler came to power, my father's store was closed to make the population aware that the owner was Jewish and to discourage people from doing business with the Jewish establishment. Some days later, business resumed at a normal rate, but our lives changed. It seemed that every year another law was passed that made our lives almost unbearable. We could not attend school anymore or use public pools. Park benches were marked where we could sit. He burned books by Jewish authors and he destroyed Jewish businesses. On November 9, 1938, Kostalnacht started. The synagogues, which is a Jewish house of worship, were destroyed. Many Jewish men were sent to concentration camps. Our parents were well known and liked. My father was tipped off by an official and was therefore able to leave town to avoid internment. The Gestapo did come to our house to look for him, but we were not molested and our house was not ransacked. 
We did not know where he went. Occasionally he called, but those were very tense days for us. His safety was always on our minds. After his return, his return, he was seriously looking to leave the country. We had received quarter numbers from the U.S. Embassy, but we were also aware that it was a very high number and there was no way we could leave before a year or two. So my father searched for a country that we could go to while waiting for our quota number. Of course, the store was closed and had to be sold to Germans for very minimal amount. My father preferred to leave Europe. He did not think it was safe to stay there. America lacked only a designated number of people to immigrate into their country. My father purchased visas, $250 per person, which in today's dollars is $4,362 for Cuba and booked passage on the ocean liner SS St. Louis that belonged to a German shipping company. Our belongings were packed and shipped to, to my uncles in the United States. We only took clothing for summer on board the ship. Before we left, my sister and I went to see our grandmother, who was blind and could not come with us. Much later, she was deported to Theresienstadt concentration camp. She was then in her late 80s. We were informed that she died of her natural causes. Can you imagine for, an, for someone that old to travel for three weeks in a cattle car? It is still very hard for me to think about that and to accept it. May 13, 1939 was a Saturday and the ship sailed in the afternoon. We stood at the railing of the ship and waved goodbye to relatives with a heavy heart. The possibility it certainly existed that we were never going to see them again. One of the things I remember was that upon boarding, the band was playing Strauss waltzes. In the captain's daily log, he noted that the mood of the passengers was very solemn, but he was assured that good food and sea air for two weeks will lift the pain that was emanating from the passengers. We settled into our new routine of shipboard life, and day by day the moods lifted. My sister and I made friends with other young people on board. One of these people became my best friend. She lived in upstate New York with her husband, who also was a passenger on the St. Louis. After a two-week voyage, we arrived in the harbor of Havana, Cuba. We were informed that we could not lay anchor at the pier because our credentials had to be checked. Even after they were checked, there were more excuses for not letting us land and disembark. A day before arrival in Cuba, the captain of the ship was informed that he cannot lay anchor at the time, at the pier. He had to stay in the middle of the harbor. We stayed in the harbor for one week. We did not want to return to Germany. Nothing was left there, no housing, no money. All the saving people had accumulated had to be left for the German government. So we would all have to be taken to concentration camps in an impossible thought. We had people on board who were released from con concentration camps under one condition, never return to Germany. These men considered mutiny or committing suicide. The captain was very diligent and did not want this to happen. 
During that time, one man slashed his wrist and jumped overboard. He was saved and taken to a hospital in Havana. His wife was not allowed to visit him, but after he recuperated, he was returned to his wife. Small boats came to the side of the St. Louis with relatives who lived in Cuba to shout encouragement to us. Meanwhile, organizations, Jewish and government, worked to, to see that can be done to have us disembark. Also, contact was made with, the, with almost every country to say if one of them would take us in. The German propaganda had a field there. No one wanted Jews. Hitler was right in ridding the country of them. The captain tried everything to enable us to land. He even went so far and visited the president of Cuba to plead for us. Nothing helped. From the ship, telegrams were sent to heads of state and Jewish organizations. The children pleaded by telegram with Mrs. Roosevelt for shelter, but no reply came from her or the president. After 10 days in limbo, the captain was told to leave Cuban waters. Very slowly, the captain steered the ship towards the United States, towards Miami, hoping that the president would relent and let us land. There were 935 people on board who were seeking refuge. Instead, the Coast Guard was on watch to see that no one jumped overboard to swim ashore. We went up the coast to New York, and then the captain was informed to hurry home. He was such a decent man that he really did not want to take us back, but he had no alternative. In his log, he wrote that he would shuttle his ship on the English shore if no result was forthcoming. This action cost him his job. Meanwhile, negotiations went on to find some country that had money, that had mercy on us. The passengers were becoming more desperate. Long faces and worried looks went on everybody's face. We were close to the English Channel when we were informed that four countries were willing to take the passenger. Morris Troper of the European Joint Distribution Committee was responsible for securing that haven. The grateful passengers cabled their thanks that their gratitude was as, was as immense as the, as the ocean on which they had been traveling. Those four countries were England, France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. You could have heard the biggest sigh when the news was broadcast. Again, people made plans, and their outlook was improving. On June 17th, we landed in Antwerp, Belgium and disembarked to immediately go on to a freighter that was provided by the German company for those who went to France and England. Our captain really tried his best and risked his life and career for us. Many years later, the surviving passengers signed a petition to recommend him as a righteous Gentile, which afforded him a place at the Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. Our family was sent to France, where my sister and I and other children were taken in by an orphanage. Our parents and other adults were placed in Le Mans, a city west of Paris. Because no one had money, we were only allowed 10 German marks, which is about $80 today's money, to take out of Germany. We all lived on charity provided by Jewish organizations. During those six months, my parents lived in Le Mans. They were supported by the Hires, a Jewish relief organization that helps immigrants. They lived in a house that was shared with three other couples, one bedroom each, 
communion in the kitchen and living room. When the war broke out, September 1st, 1939, all the men were interned and foreigners, as foreigners, and the women had to double up. My sister and I and all other children under 18 were sent by train to the Jose homes near Paris. The Jose is a Russian organization that is involved with the care of orphans. These homes were led by a Viennese educator and his wife, a physician. Personally, I enjoyed my stay there, although once the war broke out, it got a little scary, especially when the air raid sirens sounded and we had to go to shelters. The older children had to take care of the young ones. The tragedy of the 935 passengers was that they had paid to leave Germany, except for those bound for England, most were again under Hitler's rule. Two-thirds of them lost their lives. We were fortunate and were able to leave France on the French line of the Grasse on Christmas Eve 1939 and arrived in the United States January 5, 1940. Those years under Hitler and then the uncertainty of the ill-fated voyage left the scars. I was married in 1950, had two sons and one grandson, and now two great-grands. Until 1988, I worked with time off to be a stay-at-home mom. I hope it was not too long. And I'm open for questions, if you have any. I think, um, Ms. Keibel, I was worried about the volume of, mm -hmm. of the speaker, and I, I missed a part. But um, did, did your parents come to the United States with you? Yes. Yes. We were always, my father insisted on staying a unit. Okay. We were always together, except that time we spent in France when they had to live someplace else. There's a question. I might have missed it, but how old you were you? You have to speak up. How old were you? I was 15. 15. But I wasn't a 15 year old by today's 15 year olds. <laughs> <laughs> Colby. Um, what was your sister's name? Alice. Um, where did you go when you got off the ship? Where did I go when? When you got off the ship? Uh, we went to France. Then we were assigned to go there. You know. mm -hmm. Mr. Henneman. It seemed like a long time to be on a boat. You went to Cuba, you went up the coast to the United States, you went to France. How did you maintain your strength and hope? It's difficult. There wasn't always hope. I know that even we children, we spoke of suicide. I don't think I could have done that. But, but thank goodness it didn't have to be that way. Uh, we were on the ship for a whole month. Voyage that should have taken a week or uh, two weeks in those days, yeah. Kala? How many other countries did people go to? How many other countries did people go to? How many other countries? How many other countries did people go to when they were let off the ship? Oh, Belgium, the Netherlands, France and England. How did you and your family get reunited? Hmm? How did you and your family get reunited? To the United States? No, reunited. In in France, do you mean? Yeah. So how did how did you and your family get reunited when you were in the orphanage um, in no, France? And then we didn't live together, of course. 
the time we were in France, we did not live together. Yeah. But but did you and your parents always know where each other yes. was? Yes, they did visit us. We didn't visit them, but they visited us. Okay. It was like camp life. To this day, we hear about people on ships trying to find sanctuary in another country, they're turned down. They go to another country, they're turned down. Um, how do you think this can be solved? Do you have any idea? Do you talk about what should yes, happen? Yes, we have many thoughts on that. But the only way is that some somebody's kind enough to let you in if you have if you don't have any place to go. And that's why I did make these speeches not only to the kids but to adults to realize that other people have the same situation. And you can't be prejudiced. Two-part question. You you had said that your father fought for Germany in World War One. Is that right? Or somebody in your family had fought for Germany in World War One? Your your father fought for Germany in World War One. Yes. And um, I would, oh, I was just wondering if you could speak to like how long a history your family had as Germans building up the German nation to then be turned into foreigners. I wondered when you when you left with eighty dollars equivalent, how much did your family have that was taken at that point? Well, I don't know that. I was a child. My parents didn't tell me <laughs> what they had. Right. Uh, but they lived a comfortable life and he was able to pay all this. I mean he, it, it, the money was supposed to be paid in dollars. So my uncles here did this, but my father gave them the money. We didn't enjoy it, you didn't have dollars. Do you, do you feel happy to be in the United States? <clears throat> do you feel happy to be in the United States? Oh, yes. Very comfortable in the United States. Yeah. You're from the United States? No, no. I'm from Nicaragua. From where? Nicaragua. Nicaragua. Central oh. America. Oh. Okay, are you happy here? Yeah, so far. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. I guess this is just part of World War II history that I never knew about or never learned about. Um, so, you were trying to get to the United States originally, if I understood Oops, could correctly. could you come up a little closer? Thank you. So I just want to make sure I understand part of the history here. So you were trying to get to the United States originally from Germany, yes. correct? Yes, yes. And you were, you were turned away when you originally got to the United States because your number to come in had not come up yet, is that right. correct? Yes. So yes. I never, I never knew that. I never knew uh, that we turned people. Well, away. I don't think that happens now. In those days, you know, in the thirties and forties, they had this quota system. So I that's guess when so you then, landed in France instead, because you were well, but from the we got States. the quota number in Germany when we were in Germany, and with this quota number, we were in France. And in France, they didn't have that many people coming to America. That's why we had, it was faster in France. Okay. Did, that, did, did that impact your feelings about eventually coming to the United States at the time, after having been turned away once? From the United States, yeah, but, um, well, we still wanted to come to the United States. We had family here that had come much earlier, and I mean, it wasn't a personal thing that they returned back. It was the whole ship, mm -hmm. 935 people. 
And it wasn't only America, it was Canada, which is a big country, could afford to take 935 passengers, and many other countries. What year was it when you came to the United States? 1940, January 5th, 1940. Wow. How did you go from France to America? From France to where? To America? Yeah. And yeah. both. Oh. And this was during wartime. And there was ammunition on the, on the ship, and we had a we under blackout conditions, but thank goodness we didn't get any U-boats. <laughs> what do you mean by blackout conditions? You had to no keep light. We no light. No lights. No light should shine outside. The blinds, um, the windows, and all of that. Yeah. So that um, war boats couldn't see right. you. Right. That must have been really frightening, it perhaps. Was. Yes, and to get on another ship, were you feeling more confident when you got on the ship in France to sail I to America? I don't remember really, but I can't imagine. Well, mm -hmm. yes, we were confident because now we're going to America. We knew we were going to go. Okay. Yeah. What did it feel like to be turned away? What did it feel like to be turned away? It was a horrible feeling. Nobody wanted us. If you're not wanted, you have no friends, no, nobody who would take you, who would love you. Her name was Ruth, and we just became friends and we exchanged. In those days, we didn't have those eye pants or like that. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to write letters, and I visited her. She visited me, and our children were almost the same age. And we just shared. It was just like having another sister. Oh, well, which one? Who goes first? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, how many kids did you have? How many children I had? I have one sister. I had one sister. She's not alive anymore. Okay. Next. Uh, where is your friend that was on a ship? Did you say she... She lives in New, uh, Ithaca, New York. How old was your friend? She was a year younger than I. Annika. Um, so when, like, what country did your friend go to before she went to the US? Like, did she go to the She was in France also, yes. It's we spent everything. And we left France earlier than she did, but when she came to New York, we picked up again. Charlie. Do you see your friend There's now? There's a little boy oh, back there. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, Charlie first. Could you stand up and ask, and then we'll... Uh, do you see your friend now? My friend is not alive anymore. Sorry. Christine. Have you visited Germany after that happened to you? Have you been back to Germany? No. Did you have any other friends on the boat? Did you? There were a lot of other people my age, but she was the closest, and I stayed in contact with her with nobody else, I think. But everybody was all over the world, so it was difficult. So for how many years now have you been in the United States? Since 1940, that's how 60, 80 years. Emma. And on January 5th, it was 80 years. Wow. Yeah. It's a lifetime. Uh -huh. 
was the boat like that you took? Which one, Emma? Right. Emma Stonewall. Okay. In St. Louis? Yeah. It was a luxury liner. It was very nice. Uh, what would you do on the boat? Well, you yeah. have games, shuffleboard was the main thing, and um, they had races. So, you know, car races and stuff like that, and I don't really remember too much. Yeah, but we kept busy. There's a swimming pool, so we went swimming. I said it was a luxury liner. <laughs> <laughs> How did you like the book, Refugee? It was very interesting, yes. But the boy that was on the same boy, uh, of course it was a novel, so not everything was the way it was on the same boy. It was embellished. It's just like the movie, in Voyage of the Damned. It was also a little Hollywood. Did you have any uh, fun times on the boat? Did, Did you have any fun times on the boat? Any what? Any fun times on the ship? Fun times? Fun. fun. Was the yes. boat, was there, were there fun things on the boat? I don't remember fun things. We made our own fun. <laughs> yeah. Right. Would you ever want to go back to Germany? No. Okay, to, um, I think often our, our kids know uh, more about um, the war and, and some of the atrocities of the war and the fact of the um, concentration camps. I wonder, are, could you speak more to, you were talking about the slow erosion of the rights of your family before the war? Uh, like when um, you said each next year there would be more laws making it hard for your father to do business and making it hard to just be Jewish in Germany. I was wondering if you could say anything about that period of time before the war, when before the war, when they were taking away the rights of Jewish people slowly. Yeah, well, but before the 33, I was 10 years old when Hitler came to power. It, uh, of course, it, once we couldn't go to school anymore, that was really the hardest time. Or being in a park when you can't do what you want to do in a park and play. Thank we you were restricted. Yeah. Uh, we learned to swim in public full pools. No more. Thank you. Sure. And so offhand, I can't think of another thing that was... Uh, oh, my father's business. You know, people were restricted to come to the store to shop, so. So pe people were forbidden from spending money at your father's shop, even, you're saying, as well, <coughs> in that drama. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rosenberg, did you have a question? When you got to America, did you experience any anti-Semitism? Thank you, Pam. When you got to America, did you experience any anti-Semitism? When you arrived in America, did you experience no. anti-Semitism? No, no. Have you ever in America? No, not really. Go ahead. No. I went to school here. Oh, what was your dad when he started his store? How, how old was your dad when he started his store business? <laughs> I mean, looking back, he must have been in his 40s because he got married when he was 38 because he was in the war, four years of army life, and then he got married. So he must have been the middle 40s. So... 
your the ship went to Cuba first. Yes. Why did was it too dangerous to come through the waters to America first, or was Cuba more accepting of the ship? Why did you go to Cuba first before the United States? Because the United States, we couldn't enter the United States because our visa, our quota number wasn't up. So the people, there are a lot of people, German Jews, who left, they went to England or the other countries in Europe. And my father didn't want to go to Europe anymore. So what was open was China or Cuba. I would have liked to go to China on a long trip on a boat. <laughs> but he preferred Cuba, and I was on a long trip on a boat, too, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> but this was just a stayover for us, Cuba. We went waiting in Cuba for the number to come up so we can go to the United States. Um, did you get ever like did you ever get sick of the ship at some point? Yes, the ship coming to America was the end of December and January. So the ocean wasn't as smooth as it is in May. And I was uh, we call it sickness. Sea sickness? Mm -hmm. Motion sickness? sickness? Motion sickness. Yeah, I couldn't think of that. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Did you, get, did you get tired of being on the ship? You know, it, it's... You mean on the St. Louis? Or yeah, on the, on the St. Louis. I mean, it seems like at least you were safe on the ship but you were on there for an awful long time, and your, your emotions went up when you were hopeful that a country would let you in, right. and then it must have been devastating when they said no. Um, yes, it was, absolutely. But you were eager to get off the ship? You were, oh, yes. Were you tired of being on the ship? Yes, yes. But, you know, as children, you find fun with yourself, mm -hmm. with, your, with your people your age. So I don't know. I'm sure the older people had a lot of concerns. Mm -hmm. Of course, we never asked. In those days, you didn't ask your parents. You accepted. Right. Right. There wasn't a conversation about it. No. Right. No, That's pretty different not. today. It is, yes. yes. Much different. Yeah. So. Emma. Uh, what were your first thoughts when they said you might go back to Germany? What were your first thoughts when you thought that you might have to go back to Germany? It was devastating because the only thing open was concentration camps. And who wanted to go there? That's why there was a lot of talk about suicide. Never happened. We had a wonderful captain who prevented all this to get our hopes up. Were you ever able to talk to the captain? I don't remember, to tell you the truth. And I, I suppose he talked to the adults, but you know, being we were children. So I hope I'm not overtaking my time. Uh, <laughs> I'm immensely curious about two communist countries um, accepting, you know, people from your ship. Mm -hmm. Um, yet, France was not a communist country. China? China was a Oh. China was a Ah, 49, missed it by nine years. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Castro? No. Yeah. yeah. But that was pre Castro. Cuba was pre Castro. It was, what was his name? Boo? Boo, the president. <laughs> There's still a lot of prejudice in the world today, and um, 
what do you think the answer is to, um, what is the answer to people's prejudice? How do we, how do we help people to? I wish I had the answer. Mm -hmm. I mean, a human being is a human being. What your beliefs are is something for yourself. And if you if you are a Christian and then you have a Jewish friend, why can't you have a Jewish friend as a Christian? But Hitler didn't want that either. You didn't understand that. You got that? Okay. I don't know, was I right in explaining it that way? You did well. Okay. We got that. Yeah. Was France nice? Hmm? Was France nice? Like, was it beautiful? It was beautiful. Was France. France. Yeah. Uh, oh, because I said I had a good time. Well, the condition in France where my sister and I went, it was like, I think we'd consider camp life. They were all youngsters and different age groups. Uh, and I was in the older one, the older age group, and we helped in the kitchen. We cooked food. We took care of the little ones, which is fun sometimes. Uh, and we did a lot of games, and we had little Olympics. It was different from what I had when I was in Germany. Uh, how old was your sister? She's three years younger than I. Was that your question, Annika? Yeah, you want the age? She was oh. 13. Yeah. yeah. Oh. What did you first think of America when you came here? <laughs> That's a nice question. <laughs> well, it was overwhelming because we did not speak English, okay? And I arrived in January. In February, the new school semester started. They had different types of... So we had to go to school because we lost a lot of schooling in Germany. So you get into the school where only English is spoken. There's no such thing as English as a second language. Forget it. <laughs> uh, and I'm very much against that English as a second language <laughs> because of that. It was very difficult to compete with, with my co-children in my class. Uh, so. I did very little. We had to read books. Silas Mano was the first book I was supposed to read. Oh, Never boy. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I don't know what it's all about. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was very hard. But after six months of hearing nothing but English, at least in, during school days, you sort of absorbed the language. And then... Uh, that first summer, I took care of a little boy uh, in, well, it doesn't matter where because you're not from New York, <laughs> at the beach. And, of course, with him, I learned English also. I mean, he didn't speak very much yet. He was tiny, so. And by the September semester, I could compete with the others. My sister listened to the radio, to all the uh, soap operas. <laughs> you spoke of feeling unwanted in your first journey, and I'm wondering if you could speak to how, how you do feel wanted or welcomed. Do you, how she feels welcomed now? or yeah. Okay. Um, you spoke of feeling unwanted on your journey. Um, and in, in what ways do you feel wanted now? 
Well, we had family in the United States. They loved us. And I had my parents. They still loved us, even if we weren't wanted by the popular people. The people who mattered, they still, they still loved us. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Megan. What is the most common emotion you felt during your journey? Like, what's the most common emotion that you felt during the first journey? What, what was the most common emotion you felt um, when you were on the MS? St. Louis? Louis? Yeah. I don't know how to answer that. I'm sorry? I don't know how to answer that. You don't that. know don't how know to answer that yet. Exactly. Oh. Me you mean yeah. that I was glad I was on the ship? Right. Or were you? Oh, what? yes. We were very happy to get onto the ship because we were leaving Germany. That was the purpose. So, of course, the ship was not at fault. The ship had nothing to do with us not landing. It's the people who lead this whole thing. Uh, I think there was a lot of controversy between Germany and... Uh, no, there were... Germany and Cuba, I think, had spies or something going. And... Uh, and I think originally that ship would should never have landed, would never have landed, even when it left Germany. I think they knew that there was never going to be a landing in Cuba. We didn't know that. But these are the uh, people wow. on the inside. Wow. You mentioned in the article in Seven Days that... Um, they, they asked you how you got your education, and you said very haphazardly. I yes. think those were your words. Yeah. Was your, could be, I don't remember. Okay, was, was your education really important to you? Did you miss school when you were? Yes, definitely. Everybody else went to school, and I couldn't. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there was a lot of things I had to learn in a very short time to be able to graduate with my other uh, same age people mm -hmm. in high school here. Mm -hmm. So that uh, those two years in high school here were tough, very tough. Right. First it was the language and then all the other things that I didn't know. So um, w another thing about education, um, I think, you know, you probably sometimes hear this in the news that, um, you know, sometimes our, our students aren't doing well or we're, we're not invested in education like we should be or maybe some students don't see the value of education. What, what advice would you give to those students? You don't know. You were you missed school though when you couldn't go. Yes, you really I wanted school, to be there yes. because. Well, I think you need a certain amount of education. You read mm -hmm. certain books, or you know. And then I was interested in geography at one point in time, so I missed that part too. Mm -hmm. Geography was and so. Yep. Education is important. I'm sorry, I never went to college. Mm -hmm. But there was just no money for that. Mm -hmm. Did you have any friends that, like, like German friends that, like, turned against you? No, I don't really mem remember that. Most of my friends were Jewish. Uh, what did it feel like when you got separated from your parents? What did it feel like when you got separated from your parents? When you were when you were separated from your parents in France, oh. do you mean? Anyway. Yeah. Well, we missed our parents. Yes, it wasn't a very happy. But there's nothing we could do about it. You know, they couldn't afford us. They had no money. 
We were all relying on on charity. So of course we missed out. But they did come to visit us a few times. Again, the charity had a paper band. <laughs> Any, any final questions? Does anybody have? Yes, Mr. Perigo. Um, so we're very happy to have you living in Vermont now. I wonder if you could tell us the story of how you came to Vermont. <laughs> um, well, I was getting on in age, and I have another son, and he moved to South Carolina. And Peter was, my other son was here in Vermont. So I was in New York, I had friends and everything, and I was used to it. But the friends got less and less. So we discussed what should happen. So of course Peter wanted me to come here. And uh, and I preferred that to South Carolina. That didn't appeal to me too much. I, I, guess. I, I thought I put so up here. Did I move up? It was, I don't know, like a week. So I was up here to oh, look I around for a while. Maybe I brought him out here. It's just living places. And I made a decision to go to Burlington. And now you have 40 new friends. <laughs> How are you liking Vermont? I like it. I'm comfortable. Yes. I mean, I've been in Vermont before. I mean, I visited my son here often. He's been here for many years. So I was not completely unfamiliar with him. Mm -hmm. And I like to look at the snow. Yes. I can't hear you. You have to speak loud. What school did you come to when you came to What, what? What school did you come to when you came to? Oh, what school? I went to school in New York, in, in Queens, through the Richmond Hill High School. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, my, no. my Any questions for our students before we wrap up? No, I don't think so. Yeah. Well, we have um, one of our students would like to present you with something. Charlie, why don't you step up here so we can all see you? My name is Charlie, and this is my family's cheese, and we heard that you really like Justin. Yeah. Cheese. <laughs> cheese. Hmm? The cheese is a really cheese? good cheese. Oh my goodness, cheese. I love cheese. <laughs> <laughs> that is very nice wow. of you, really. It's very sweet. Wow. Thank you so much. Maybe Thank your parents so for you it, too. Yes. <laughs> yeah, maybe they all want to see such cheese. <laughs> You'll have lots of people to share it with. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes absolutely. Yes. Well, we really appreciate you coming over in a snowstorm <laughs> to, to visit with it us. Was, it was very nice. I had never spoken to young people like you, so I enjoyed that very much. <laughs>